Hello and welcome to True Fiction. Today we'll dive into the life of Oleg Gordievsky and find out how he prevented World War III and escaped the clutches of the KGB. Gordievsky was born the son of a KGB officer, which granted him a reasonably comfortable life growing up. This also formed his early career ambition of joining the KGB, which he described as an exclusive club to join and an impossible one to leave. Gordievsky studied at university in Moscow, becoming fluent in German and undertook further KGB training, where he learned to speak Danish, Swedish and Norwegian. As planned, Gordievsky joined the KGB in 1962 and was assigned to the Soviet embassy in Copenhagen, Denmark, with the job of supporting illegals in the country. During the Cold War, illegals were secret agents posted overseas, where they would work ordinary jobs and tasked with missions to try and gather intelligence, although they were generally ineffective. Former KGB general Oleg Kalugin described them as the most secretive and least productive in his memoirs. Despite being an outwardly loyal KGB officer, Gordievsky was soon disillusioned by the secret knowledge of the West he had accumulated, partly through his love of classical music, which was forbidden in the Soviet Union, and partly his shock at the nature and extent of the Soviet repression in Hungary and later Czechoslovakia. In sharp contrast, Gordievsky found Denmark very much to his liking, commenting, I could only look back on the vast, sterile concentration camp of the Soviet Union as a form of hell. Meanwhile, the small but efficient Danish security service became increasingly convinced that Gordievsky was a KGB officer rather than a true diplomat. As they already knew, only six of the 20 Soviet personnel assigned to the Copenhagen Embassy were actual diplomats, the other 14 being either KGB or GRU officers. When his university running buddy and intellectual confidant, Stan Kaplan, studying to be a Russian military translator, defective, the latter mentioned his friend's disillusionment and Gordievsky was immediately flagged as a person of interest to MI6, which codenamed him Sunbeam. Gordievsky rotated back to the Soviet Union in January 1970, struck by how shabby everything seemed. Gordievsky married, returning to Copenhagen in 1972, with his new wife and his new rank of major. The efficient, the Danish security service contacted MI6, the secret intelligence service of the United Kingdom, to assist with approaching Gordievsky in an attempt to recruit him as a double agent. Gordievsky was visited by legendary MI6 figure Richard Bromhead, and then by Kaplan, whom Oleg suspected was dispatched to recruit him. Shortly before Bromhead was reassigned, Gordievsky told him that he had not reported their meeting to the KGB, the prelude to Sunbeam becoming a formal MI6 recruit. The British service would run their promising asset, notably without informing the CIA of their newfound treasure. Predictably, the British started with the presumption that such a high-ranking figure as Gordievsky had to be a dangle, only to conclude after various tests that he was a legitimate asset. MI6 concluded that Gordievsky had truly defected and began providing high-grade intelligence to MI6. Gordievsky requested that MI6 put in place an exfiltration plan in the event that he would need to escape from the Soviet Union, nicknamed Operation Pimlico, a plan that would later be of vital importance. To the delight of MI6, a vacancy appeared at the Russian Embassy in London for an English-speaking diplomatic officer and Gordievsky was selected though he was not finally cleared to travel to the United Kingdom until June 1982. For the next three months, Gordievsky provided the British with the largest take of intelligence information in MI6's history. Gordievsky provided several startling revelations, including that the KGB was flawed, clumsy, inefficient, and that the Kremlin leadership was absolutely convinced that the West was about to launch a surprise nuclear attack on the Soviet Union in 1982-1983 the premise behind Operation Ryan. It is widely believed that this information was critical in preventing the outbreak of World War III. MI6 began dribbling out such information to the CIA, though never divulging the source. Ironically, as Oleg's stock with MI6 rose sharply, his Moscow centre superiors were increasingly dissatisfied with him. In short, Gordievsky was floundering at his job. His MI6 minders launched a two-pronged effort to salvage his career, and his value as a source to them. First, they removed obstacles to his career progression, such as Line PR chief Igor Titov, who was removed in March 1983 and replaced by Gordievsky, 
now promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Before long, two other superiors were similarly removed, and the position of resident of the London Embassy was dangled in front of Oleg's eyes. Second, MI6 realised that Gordievsky needed to provide valuable information to please his Moscow mentors, and so began feeding him genuine, though valueless, information. Meanwhile, Burton Gerber, the head of Soviet operations at the CIA, was increasingly annoyed that he did not know the identity of MI6's highly placed spy, and launched an investigation to answer that vexing question. Regrettably, that task was given to Aldrich Ames, a Soviet double agent for the KGB, described by McIntyre as part of the furniture of the CIA, tatty but familiar. By March 1985, he had identified Gordievsky as the KGB spy. Gordievsky was due to take over as the official London resident at the end of April 1985, 12 days before Ames had volunteered to work for the KGB. While it seems likely that Ames told the KGB about Gordievsky in their initial meeting, it is not clear if he knew his name at the time. In response, the KGB launched the largest manhunt in its history to locate the British mole. Colonel Viktor Budinov, head of Directorate K, reputedly the most dangerous man in the KGB, knew a mole existed, likely in the London Residentura, but Gordievsky was not the only suspect. Three months after taking charge in London, Gordievsky was recalled to Moscow, prompting MI6 to ponder the reason. Belated congratulations or a trap? Despite the potential danger, Gordievsky opted to return on the 19th of May, 1985, with MI6 reassuring him that if it went bad, Operation Pimlico was in place and ready for activation. What began as a fairly civil meeting quickly devolved into a brutal interrogation, aided by spiked brandy. Gordievsky's second wife, Leila, daughter of a KGB general, and their two daughters were sent back to Moscow, causing panic in MI6. On the 13th of June, Ames named 25 spies working against the Soviet Union, including Gordievsky. However, rather than facing relentless interrogation followed by a bullet to the back of the head, Gordievsky was somewhat surprised to instead be sent to a state-run sanatorium for senior officials for a period of rest and relaxation, though he was still under heavy surveillance. Following his enforced vacation and return to his family, Gordievsky decided that in order to survive, he had to escape. But should he take Leila and his daughters, now aged five and three, with him? As he agonised over what to do, Gordievsky realised that though he loved Leila, he did not entirely trust her, and as McIntyre put it, in one part of his heart, he feared her. Leila was still KGB, and he was not. When he tested her on her willingness to flee, she responded coldly, don't be idiotic, giving Gordievsky the answer he expected, but dreaded hearing. After a nervous mist brush pass, he was finally able to leave this message for MI6. I am under strong suspicion and in bad trouble. Need exfiltration soonest. Beware of radioactive dust and car accidents. In response, the British service implemented Operation Pimlico, which required the personal approval of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who never learned that the operation was approved was already underway. Committed to escaping, Gordievsky was savvy enough to convince all his friends and colleagues in Moscow, in every way possible, that he was not going anywhere, except in social commitments he never intended to keep. Meanwhile, his MI6 team made preparations for his escape, which would involve a road trip from Moscow to Leningrad, Finland, Norway, and then to the United Kingdom. Gordievsky waited on a particular street corner on a Tuesday at 7.30pm carrying a Safeway bag as a signal. An MI6 agent walked past carrying a Harrods bag and eating a Mars bar, and the two made eye contact. That indicated that the escape plan was in place. The next day, on the 19th of July 1985, Gordievsky went for his usual jog, but instead he managed to evade his KGB trails and boarded a train to Viborg near the Finnish border. He was met by British em embassy cars. Lying down in the boot of a Ford Sierra saloon, he was smuggled across the border into Finland, managing to lose three pursuing KGB cars, and then flown to the UK via Norway. Soviet authorities subsequently sentenced Gordievsky to death in absentia for treason, a sentence never retracted by the post-Soviet Russian authorities. Once he arrived in Britain, he was spirited to the MI6 training base at Fort Moncton, where he spent the next four months being debriefed. MI6 now confirmed Gordievsky's identity to the CIA, letting its intelligence cousin, 
no, that the inside information on Project Ryan had come from him. Among Gordievsky's numerous visitors at Fort Moncton was DCI William Casey, who asked Oleg for advice on what President Reagan should say in his first meeting with Premier Mikhail Gorbachev. Notably, Gordievsky told the DCI that continued US emphasis on strategic defence initiative would ruin the Soviet leadership and bankrupt the country, a coining piece of analysis. With Gordievsky now safe, the focus turned to reuniting him with his wife and daughters, an undertaking known to MI6 as Operation Hetman, which would take a grueling six years to complete. Still in Moscow, Leila had lost her job and apartment and was under virtual house arrest and had changed the children's last names. Subtle British inquiries about getting them out of Russia were dismissed out of hand by the Soviets. Gordievsky lives in a house bought for him by MI6, using an assumed name while writing books with historian Christopher Andrew, having audiences with Prime Minister Thatcher, as well as President Reagan at the White House. Possibly in response to diplomatic pressure, the KGB told Layla that if she would divorce Oleg, her property would be re returned, which she did, reverting to her maiden name in the process. In September, the new KGB director, Vadim Bakating, agreed to free Layla and the girls, who then flew to London to rejoin Oleg. Three months later, the Soviet Union dissolved, and two years later, so did the marriage of Oleg and Leila, who parted in 1993 and never saw each other again. Gordievsky received the Order of St. Michael and St. George from the UK for his service, and now lives in a safe house in London, which has tight security from the UK amid concerns of poisoning attacks.